For the first time ever, CrimeCon, the world's number one true crime event, is going international. CrimeCon UK will take place in London this September 25th and 26th. The weekend will be filled with true crime presentations and experiences from leading criminologists, families and survivors, forensic experts, journalists, celebrities from the true crime world, and more. You'll also have the chance to meet all your favorite true crime podcasters on CrimeCon's podcast row. I'll be there to hang out with you, answer questions, and talk true crime. CrimeCon is the ultimate true crime weekend partnered by Crime and Investigation. You won't want to miss it. So hit up your best true crime friends and plan for a great weekend of true crime on September 25th and 26th in London. To join me at CrimeCon UK, go to crimecon.co.uk. When you register, use my offer code onceupon21 to get 10% off your tickets. That's crimecon.co.uk. And use offer code onceupon21 to get 10% off your ticket. And I'll see you there. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. Last month's series was Buried Truth, where I told you about killers who hid their deadly secrets for months or even years before their crimes were discovered. It got me wondering, how does someone live with that kind of secret? Does it keep them up at night? Make them look over their shoulder every day, wondering when they'll be found out? And do they ever have the urge to confess their sins? Those questions were the inspiration for this month's series, Deathbed Confessions. In this series, you'll meet people who've kept dark secrets all their lives, but who decide to finally reveal the truth when it appears their time on Earth is ending. In this first episode, a dying woman reveals the truth to her children, leading to a shocking discovery. This is Chapter 1 of Deathbed Confessions, The Confession of Geraldine Kelly. John Kelly and Geraldine DiMarzio grew up in the same neighborhood of Somerville, Massachusetts. They attended Somerville High School together where they first began dating. They made a well-matched couple with petite, dark-haired Jerry standing at 5 foot 2 inches tall and John also of smaller stature at 5 foot 6 and weighing just over 130 pounds. After graduation, John served in the Army before returning to Somerville. He married his high school sweetheart, Jerry, and they settled in their hometown. The Kellys had two children back-to-back. A daughter they named Sherry was born in 1968, and their son John in 1969. John Kelly was the kind of guy who could fix anything. He enjoyed working on cars the most, and later would open up his own auto repair shop. John was more introverted around strangers, while Jerry was the more social of the two, easily conversing with anyone she'd meet. With two small children to raise, the Kellys discovered a way to put their individual skills and talents to use to make ends meet. In the mid-1970s, they began working as co-managers of an apartment complex. Jerry was in charge of dealing with tenant issues, while John took care of any repairs that needed to be done. As managers, they were provided with an apartment and a small salary. People would say that Jerry's appearance could be deceiving. Even though petite, Jerry was said to be tough as nails. Physically, she was strong, and moving boxes and flipping mattresses was no problem for her. In addition, Jerry had a strong personality and didn't often mince words. She would say whatever was on her mind, and not always in the nicest way. Although the Kellys had been together since they were kids, no one described their relationship as a fairy tale or a love story. There was a lot of arguing in the marriage, and although no one specifically reported physical violence between John and Jerry, Their contentious relationship often made for a tense home and put a strain on the children. John was really a nice guy, according to his friend Thomas McCann, but he had a mean streak. McCann, who'd known Kelly since they were teens, said that a different side came out when John was drinking. However, some would say they were more intimidated by Jerry than her husband. 
McCann said that Jerry, quote, was tough. She wouldn't back down from anything, end quote. There also appears to have been tension with extended family members. When families continue to live in close proximity to one another into their adult lives, petty fights and feuds sometimes spring up between siblings, cousins, in-laws, etc. The Kelly family was no exception, and tensions boiled over during a family wedding in 1981. Liquor started flowing during an August wedding reception in a Somerville community center, and some immediate and extended family members of the Kellys got into a shouting match, which then became a brawl. Who started it or what the argument was about is unclear. But before it was all over, at least 20 people were throwing punches, kicks, and worse, and the police were called. The responding officers would describe the scene as a pile of people assaulting one another. Several people were injured in the melee, with Edward Gordonier, 42, receiving the worst beating. Gordonier was John Kelly's brother-in-law. He was married to Noreen, John's sister. Gordonier was rushed to the emergency room with massive internal injuries to his stomach and kidneys. The father of three was rushed into surgery, but remained in a coma. He would undergo three operations, including one to remove a portion of his stomach. A month after the brawl, Ed Gordonier would die after his kidneys failed and nothing else could be done. Meanwhile, several involved in the fight would face charges from disorderly conduct to assault and battery. An 18-year-old and another man were charged with assaulting John Kelly. John Kelly was charged with assault and battery on the 18-year-old and disorderly conduct. Even Ed Gordonier's wife, Noreen, faced criminal charges. She was accused of assaulting one of the responding officers. However, Ed Gordonier's family would file a lawsuit claiming that it was the police who were responsible for his injuries and death. After an investigation, Somerville Chief of Police Arthur J. Pino would report he was satisfied that none of his officers were involved in injuring Gordonier. In the end, no one would be charged with his death. Some would later speculate that John Kelly wanted to get away from Somerville after this tragedy. Others, like his sister Margaret, explained that John and Geraldine decided to move due to, quote, simple feuds with family and for a variety of other reasons. Thomas McCann would later state that his friend John Kelly told him he was afraid he'd be blamed for his brother-in-law's death and charged with murder. Others, including Gordonier's family, would later dispute this. Whatever the reason, Jerry and John Kelly pulled up stakes in 1988 and moved across the country, landing in Southern California. Within three years, John Kelly would be dead, and for 13 years, his death would remain a mystery to all but Jerry. I'm loving a new crime mystery puzzle game called Small Town Murders. With over 5 million players already, it's the murder mystery game everyone is talking about. In Small Town Murders, you solve puzzles to unlock clues and evidence and interrogate suspects to solve the case and catch a killer. I just started playing and I'm already on level 71, so that should give you a hint at how obsessed I am with Small Town Murders. With more than 3,000 levels and 2,000 clues and pieces of evidence to collect, Small Town Murders is a must-play for true crime and mystery fans. There are already 20 cases to solve, I've almost wrapped up my first case, and more added each month, so you'll never run out of puzzles to solve. I love the colorful graphics in Small Town Murders and how with each puzzle you solve, you're taken to new rooms and locations to search out clues. And you can play Small Town Murders for free. To become a detective today, all you have to do is download Small Town Murders free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. You'll love this interactive murder mystery game. That's Small Town Murders on the Apple App Store or Google Play. According to a friend of his, John Kelly said he was leaving his hometown of Somerville, Massachusetts and making a complete break with his past. I'm severing all ties, Kelly allegedly told Thomas McCann, before hitting the road around 1988. It appeared he did just that. McCann never heard from Kelly again, nor, it appears, did any of his other friends or most of his family, including his own children. By 1988, John and Jerry Kelly's children were 18 and 19 years old and had since left home. According to reports, 
They had grown weary of their mother and father's frequent fights and arguments, so as soon as they were no longer minors, they too cut ties and avoided contact with either John or Jerry. Perhaps this was another reason the couple decided to move out of state. They headed for the other side of the country, landing in Ventura, California, where they applied for a job as managers of the Victoria Motel. The 36-room motel was in a more low-rent part of town, but located just a few miles from the beach, and so provided a budget-friendly option for travelers. The motel, owned by Valerie and Don Cayunque, was being leased at that time by Richard Tan. He hired the Kellys after receiving their resume, which outlined their skills and experience. They presented themselves as a couple who worked as a team, with both willing and able to handle plumbing, electrical, painting, and other types of repair work. They said that in addition to the auto repair shop John Kelly had owned and run, they had also owned and managed two apartment complexes together in Somerville, Massachusetts between 1975 and 1986. Upon being hired, the Kellys were also provided an apartment in the motel. They would live on site and be responsible for renting rooms, overseeing other employees such as the housekeeping staff, and day-to-day -day guest relations, as well as repairs and maintenance. John was described by his employers as a quiet man who kept to himself. He would wave to them, but didn't go out of his way to strike up a conversation. He was a good overall handyman and a good employee, they said. Jerry Kelly made a bit more of an impression. Not only was she more social, often chatting with the owners and her co-workers, she was also a bit unconventional. The petite, dark-haired woman, now in her late 30s, sported multiple tattoos, quote, cussed like a truck driver, and had a tough, intimidating air about her. She would later acquire several pets, including a Rottweiler and a boa constrictor. She sometimes went about her duties at the motel with the snake draped around her neck, frightening some of the guests. But Valerie Kayunki said Jerry was also a hard worker and was an asset to the business because, quote, she didn't take any guff from guests, or anyone else for that matter. Outspoken and assertive, Jerry had no trouble kicking out guests who were causing disturbances, be it spring breakers, teens looking for a place to party, or other unruly individuals. She was intimidated by no one, co-workers remembered. For over two years, Jerry and John Kelly were model employees of the Victoria Motel and well regarded by their employers and most who worked alongside them. Then in early 1992, Jerry told the owners that her husband had been called out of state. He'd returned to the Boston area to help out with some family business, Jerry said. A few days later, she reported some sad news. While in Boston, John had been hit and killed by a car while crossing the street. Valerie Kayunke remembered Jerry telling her that John had been hit by a drunk driver and killed. Richard Tan, who'd hired the Kellys as a team, was also informed. Jerry added a dramatic detail in her account to Tan, saying that it had been a hit and run and that, quote, he died in the snow and nobody helped him, end quote. Everyone expressed regret for the motel manager's loss, of course, and in time, life continued on. Jerry stayed on at the Victoria, managing the motel alone. No one had really gotten to know John Kelly, and since he died in another state, they assumed his services had been held back east, so no one inquired about a funeral. Jerry rarely spoke of her husband after that time. In fact, it wasn't until three years later that his own children learned of John Kelly's death. <laughs> Jerry and John Kelly, it appears, had remained estranged from their parents since the family split up in the late 1980s. Sherry reached out to reconnect with them in the mid-90s, and it was then she learned that her father was dead. But Jerry told her daughter a different story about how John Kelly had met his demise, saying he had been killed in a car accident in Las Vegas and was buried in Nevada. Sometime later, Sherry began to ask more questions about her father. Where exactly had he been killed? Where was he buried? Geraldine continued to give vague answers. In 1997, Jerry told Marilyn Contreras, one of the motel's housekeepers who later became the manager, that her daughter was pestering her about where her father was buried. Jerry had also told Marilyn that John Kelly had been killed in an auto accident in Las Vegas. I don't know why they're all concerned because John never cared. He never loved them, Jerry told her. 
Marilyn, who'd never met John Kelly, assumed the man must have had poor relationships with his children and his wife. Jerry appeared to still harbor resentment for her deceased husband, so perhaps this was why she didn't want to let her children know where he was buried, the housekeeper concluded. Oddly, Jerry told Marilyn's husband, also an employee of the motel, another story of how her husband died. John was hit by a car and killed right there in Ventura, Paul remembered Jerry saying. She told me he was drunk, and he got hit by a car right next to the jack-in-the-box, Paul Sanchez later recalled. It appears that the couple never compared notes about what Jerry had told them, and the incident passed without question. After six years of managing the Victoria Motel, Jerry Kelly informed her employers that she was moving back to the East Coast. Her elderly mother needed looking after, and she was going to return to her hometown of Somerville to care for her. In the last week of October 1998, Geraldine Kelly hired a moving company to pack up her belongings to transport to Massachusetts. Allied Van Lines driver Mark Atkins arrived and loaded up furniture and boxes from Jerry's apartment at the motel and from a nearby storage unit. They were unloaded in early November at Jerry's new address on Cypress Street in Somerville, with some items taken to Planet Self Storage, also located in Somerville. In 2002, Geraldine's mother died. At about the same time, Jerry received some grim news. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. Everyone said that Geraldine Kelly was tough, but cancer was the one challenge she was unable to overcome. In 2004, when it was clear that her days were numbered, Jerry called her daughter to her bedside. That's when the 54-year-old made a shocking confession. In the second week of November 2004, Geraldine Kelly, dying of breast cancer, called her daughter Sherry, now 36, to her bedside. She was finally ready to tell her children the truth about their father. John Kelly had abused her for years, Jerry claimed. One day in 1991, Jerry said she had finally had enough. She had killed him and stored his body in a freezer for the past 13 years. Jerry told her daughter that she'd had the freezer transported to Somerville when she'd returned six years earlier. They would find it locked in a self-storage facility nearby. She provided Sherry with the information and the key. That weekend, on November 12th, Geraldine DeMarzio Kelly died. Sherry, as you may imagine, was shocked and unsure how to respond to her mother's confession. She didn't quite believe it could be true. She shared the information with her brother John, and together they decided to contact their family attorney to ask for advice. Once the lawyer heard about Jerry Kelly's confession, he contacted Middlesex County District Attorney Martha Coakley. The first order of business was to find out if there was actually a body locked in a storage unit, as Kelly had claimed. Officers were sent to Planet Storage in Somerville on November 18th. Inside the unit, they found a locked and duct tape freezer. It was still in a cardboard box it had been placed inside for shipment. The freezer, measuring about 6 feet by 3 feet in size, was unplugged. Officers had been provided the key by the attorney for the Kelly family. When the freezer was opened, they could smell a distinct, musty odor. There was no mistaking it as the scent of death, although it wasn't particularly strong. They looked inside and found human remains wrapped in plastic. The body was removed and taken to the medical examiner's office to be autopsied. Within 24 hours, the body had been tentatively identified as John Kelly, based on three tattoos Kelly was known to have, a panther on his shoulder, a cupid doll on one arm, and a skull on the other. The body was found in an almost mummified state. The medical examiner was able to determine it was that of a male, who had stood 5 foot 6 inches tall and was of slight build. John Kelly weighed about 135 pounds and had been 5 foot 6. The autopsy also revealed that the victim had died of a gunshot wound to the back of the head from a 38 caliber weapon. The bullet was found still lodged in the skull. The cause of death was ruled a homicide. At the same time the autopsy was being performed, a search was conducted of Geraldine Kelly's residence. Among her possessions, a 38 caliber handgun was discovered, 
which investigators believed was the murder weapon. Investigators also checked records to determine whether the body had been moved from Ventura, California to Massachusetts, as Geraldine had confessed to her daughter. Records from Allied van lines showed that Jerry had shipped the freezer across the country along with her other possessions in November of 1998. The driver recalled picking the freezer up at a Ventura self-storage and unloading it at the storage facility in Somerville, but said he did not notice anything unusual or detect a smell coming from it at that time. When he was informed of what had been found in the freezer, that he'd driven over 3,000 miles, he said he found the revelation horrifying. As others learned the truth about the demise of John Kelly and how his wife had hidden his corpse for over a dozen years, they were shocked. The media picked up the bizarre story, and those who knew the Kellys were interviewed. Some provided additional information about John and Geraldine Kelly. Employees of the Victoria Motel said that they frequently heard arguing coming from the manager's apartment, but never witnessed or heard about physical violence between the Kellys. Asked about Jerry's allegations of abuse as she claimed on her deathbed, some were skeptical. She was the boss. She told him what to do, Richard Tan, the Kelly's boss at the Victoria Motel, told reporters. The motel's owners, Valerie and Don Kayunke, said they had never witnessed any abuse, nor had ever seen John Kelly angry. They said he was a pleasant but quiet man. Valerie Kiyunki, however, now also recalled an incident soon after Jerry reported John leaving to Boston on family business. Jerry had told her employers she had to leave work for a bit. Quote, I got a run because my storage unit just called and said there's something leaking from my unit. End quote. The Kelly's children, Sherry and John, released a statement through their attorneys and requested privacy, quote, for healing and to comprehend it all, end quote. They said that until their mother's deathbed confession, she had stuck to her story that their father had been killed in an auto accident and was buried in Nevada. Having had no contact with their father for at least three years prior to his death, they'd had no reason to doubt her account. They accepted and believed their mother's story as true, their attorneys told reporters. Today, they are facing the grim reality of what has actually happened. It's a sad and sobering thought that a life could end, the details of which remain unknown, and the death go unmourned by nearly everyone. John Kelly may not have been a perfect human being, but the fact that he was not missed after his murder is its own tragedy. His faults were of the common variety. It was reported that he drank too much and sometimes got into fights while inebriated. Evidence for this, of course, is the family brawl that took place in the summer of 1981. Kelly also had one conviction in 1989 in Ventura County for driving under the influence. It would appear that Kelly decided to cut ties and leave his home state behind, perhaps in an attempt to make a personal change. What if his trigger for acting out violently, like getting into a fistfight at a wedding, was bad blood within the family? Kelly's sister confirmed that he decided to leave Somerville because he, quote, wanted to get away from the family, among other reasons. It is clear that John Kelly had no contact with his family members after leaving California, including his own siblings. He was not known as a hothead by those who were acquainted with him in California, nor did anyone report seeing him drunk. Maybe he had changed his ways. Or maybe not. It's hard to know what goes on in a person's private life, and no one in Ventura claimed to know John Kelly well. Was he a violent drunk who abused his wife, and was this the reason she'd killed him as she claimed? Perhaps, we'll never know for certain. But the fact that he was shot in the back of the head would make it unlikely the shooting had occurred during an act of self-defense. It's unfortunate that Kelly didn't try to patch up his relationship with his children. If he had, it's less likely that Geraldine Kelly would have believed hiding his body was a viable option, and maybe she wouldn't have committed the murder. At the very least, the timing and circumstances of his death would have been discovered much sooner. The result of all this family estrangement, according to D.A. Martha Coakley, was that, quote, it does not appear that anyone was aware of his disappearance. She went on to explain how such a thing was possible. It's not hard to make people disappear in a transient society when people become estranged from family and friends, Coakley stated. 
And why had Geraldine Kelly kept his body close by for so long, even transporting it across the country with her? Was that really the best way she could think of to keep her crime hidden? What if someone in a nearby storage unit had called the management about a foul smell coming from her storage space? Why hadn't she thought to dispose of the body in a location that couldn't be tied back to her, like the California desert? Or loaded the freezer in her own truck or van while moving back to the East Coast and ditching it in a desolate spot in the middle of the country? Obviously, I've spent too much time considering these grim options, but you get the idea. Finally, we need to think about why Geraldine Kelly decided after 13 years to disclose this information to her children. Yes, she was dying, and she may have concluded that the discovery would be made soon after her death anyway. Was she simply trying to unburden herself from a long-held secret? Geraldine was not described as a person who seemed to be racked with guilt all her life. Of course, being faced with your own imminent death could definitely cause a person to take stock of their life and want to put things right. Or was she simply being practical and wanting to ensure that no one else was accused of being responsible for the murder? D.A. Martha Coakley said that Kelly's confession, the details of which were not fully made known to the public, gave hints about her motivations for coming forward with the information. Coakley said it was a mix of Geraldine wanting to unburden herself and ensuring her children weren't blamed if the body was ever found. It appears her concern was for them, Coakley said. As for John Kelly's long estrangement from his family members, there would be a heartfelt statement made by a family spokesperson after the deathbed confession and the discovery of the body hit the news. Some newspaper reports alleged that Kelly had fled to California after his brother-in-law Edward Gordonier died from injuries sustained during the brawl in 1981 and because he feared he would be charged in his death. The family put out the following statement to deny these allegations, quote, We the siblings of John Kelly and the Gordonier family would like all involved to know that John Kelly was loved by his family and that several statements made to the newspapers are completely false and without merit, Deb Gordonier, Ed Gordonier's daughter, told the press. In no way did John Kelly have anything to do with the unfortunate demise of Edward Gordonier. Furthermore, John Kelly decided to pursue other interests in California five years after the death of Edward. The family has asked they be allowed to grieve for the loss of all parties involved and that no more false statements be made. Please respect our wishes during this difficult time, end quote. Court records show that two years after Gordonier's death, well before John and Geraldine left for California, the assault and disorderly conduct charges against John Kelly were dismissed. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. I'll be back next week with another chapter in the series, Deathbed Confession, and I hope you'll join me then. Thanks so much for listening and telling a friend. Would you like to get true crime trivia sent to you each week by text? You can receive texts from Once Upon a Crime by texting OUAC to 408-676-1770. That's the letters OUAC to 408-676-1770 to receive texts from Once Upon a Crime. Text messaging provided by Text Sanity. We also have extra bonus content up on our Patreon page. To become a member to receive bonus episodes, sneak peeks of upcoming series and cases, and OUAC swag sent to you in the mail, get all the details and sign up at patreon.com slash once upon a crime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Our copy editor is Crystal Dernan. Original music and final sound mix by Aaron Goldberg. Until next time, be good to one another.